Our first presentation after the break will be uh, John Kolk of uh, KFC Farms. Uh, will uh, talk to us about uh, flood to subsurface, uh, one southern Alberta irrigation story. John has farmed in the Iron Springs Enchant uh, area for over 40 years. He runs 4,000 irrigation acres, uh, three quarters of which have been brought into production over the last uh, 10 years. John served on numerous agricultural and community boards and councils. He currently chairs the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute and serves on his local church council. His presentation will cover the progression of his on-farm irrigation and the challenges and benefits of developing land for irrigation. As usual, he will add a few of his own observations and recommendations. John, come on up. Thanks, thanks, Tom. Um, good to be here. I uh, I didn't know Tom was going to be the uh, the fellow who was um, kind of running running the, the process today, um, but it just brings to mind the time an engineer died and got up to the pearly gates, and uh, he uh, he takes a look around and uh, yeah, uh, St. Peter says, "Well, welcome on in," and he goes, "You know." This could be pretty boring. There's not going to be much to do up here. Can I take a look at the other place? So the engineer goes down there, and, and uh, a few eons later, uh, God talks to, uh, or St. Peter talks to, to the devil for a minute and, and says, you know, what was that engineer I sent down there? I, I kind of want him back. I mean, he, sh he should be up here. He says, oh, no, you're not getting him back. He says, we got, uh, we got air conditioning now. We got all these other things, and... Uh, you know, like life is is looking pretty good. This guy just keeps doing more and more stuff, and and uh, you know, draining the swamps and and doing whatever uh, whatever needs to be done. And Saint Peter says, you know, you better send him back. or are going to sue you. <laughs> the devil says, he says, where are you going to get a lawyer? <laughs> yeah. Anyways, uh, when. <laughs> I, sorry, Tom, I had to. <laughs> um, so I, I was asked to, uh, to talk a little bit about uh, having developed a, a bit of dry land into irrigation. Um, it's one story of many in, in southern Alberta. Uh, there's been a lot of people who have done larger projects, smaller projects, and I, I guess uh, it's an opportunity. So, so while I'm talking about that, I, I wanted to give a little bit of history, and, and of course, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, a few comments uh, where I think we should be keeping our eyes on. I mean, we've got irrigation council here, we've got engineers here, we've got districts here, uh, environment and agriculture. So it's an opportunity to, to keep the conversation moving forward and, and that's certainly something I'd like to do. Irrigation certainly changed over the last, uh, last number of years. I'll talk about that a bit, but you know, the scale of irrigation, uh, the technology, uh, has, uh, and certainly that, uh, that's reflected in what we do on the farms. Agronomy is changing. At the agronomy update recently, uh, I, I was always taught, you know, you got to put three, four inches of water down and soak it down to the to the bottom. Now the the best uh, practices seem to say, hey, feed that that top six inches. Uh, don't over over irrigate. Uh, legislation uh, not so much changes, but the impacts it continues to have on on us. Societal expectations. Um, environmental concerns and of course efficiencies. So just a, a little quick history, and this is not a unique history in any way, but over the last uh, 60 some years, uh, my OPA uh, bought 75 acres of land with about uh, 50 acres of irrigation in the LNID near Picture Butte. Uh, Dad and Mom took that over, and the uh, big thing was bought those 33 uh, four inch irrigation pipes and uh, and an old Ford uh, pickup pulled the transmission out and put the pump on the back and carried the, the fuel out there uh, and started irrigating all 75 acres. By 72, uh, purchased some land. There was a combination of flood and hand move, so still, uh, still flood uh, that late in the, in the area. Then by 73, added some rented land and three quarters of a mile of wheel move. And uh, of course, by then I was actually having to move pipe. Uh, we had these... Uh, I can still to this day remember pushing those pipes through the crop that was about this high 
and you run over and, and help it along and you see that that uh, mover start climbing and you're running and you're running and you're running and of course it went upside down and that was a bit of a disaster but uh, those are the you know between that and, and flood irrigation and and especially uh, hand move a lot of work um, so then by t uh, by 20 or by uh, 76 we had a first water drive valley pivot um, there's some pieces of it left in uh, on that picture or on the next picture um, those things clanked all night and uh, they were a lot of work I mean they worked we used a lot of, of uh, energy a big uh, 549 pump trying to trying to pump that thing and have enough pressure to bring it up to 90 psi um, but it was an improvement and certainly on lighter land it allowed us to grow a crop and, and to water that crop further into the season. Um, by 85, the first electric drive uh, pivot, but it was high pressure, uh, so still running 80, 90 PSI at the, at the pump. Uh, my brother and I then bought the farm operations, um, four pivots, uh, still 320 acres on Thunderbird wheel lines. They were so great because you didn't have to walk halfway down the field and uh, you could run in a whole half, uh, half mile at the time. Um, uh, by 89, um, or sorry, by 2008, the farm operations, we've got about 10 pivots around, no more wheel lines, just uh, labor, um, efficiency, all kinds of reasons. And uh, pivots are going in low pressure, uh, and that certainly reduced pumping costs and, uh, and probably improved a lot what we were doing. By 2010, uh, brother and I separated operations and we moved into that Enchant area. The land of opportunity, I uh, kept getting told, so uh, that was where we went. Then in 2012, uh, the beer ID came out with uh, an expansion option, and uh, so we developed about 800 acres of dry land into irrigation. Um, actually put our first uh, variable rate uh, on a number of, uh, of those, um, those units, and uh, kind of an expensive uh, learning experience. It took us five years of learning and, and they still had to replace the equipment, but the equipment's starting to get a bit more resilient for our weather now. And then in uh, 2013, started to develop about 2,800 acres of uh, dry land into irrigation, including some VRI pivots. And then uh, more recently, we put 17 acres of, of subsurface in. We've also, over the years, like most of us, uh, worked with things like uh, Hose reels, trying to do those corners and those oddball places, um, and big guns. Um, but uh, we basically settled on a pretty simple uh, seven tower system that, um, especially with VRA on certain locations. The uh, subsurface, um, I've I got to say overall, that's been a really good experience. We did it on a, on a low cost uh, location we could never put a pivot on. Um, we put it in there, installation and, and care of installation is critical with that. Uh, costs are still up there, um, but it's interesting that we're seeing once more a bit of a reduction in, in water consumption, and, uh, and certainly the disease thing looks like we've got some improvement there. So it's something that uh, we're probably not ready for full market except in specialty circumstances with the, the crops that we have in southern Alberta, uh, but it's not going away. And then uh, the, other, the other thing in terms of the technology side, uh, you know, move to have all the co pivots connected to the internet and control it by s controllable by smartphones. Um, I have one guy that takes care of 30, 36 pivots, you know, like... It, when we were irrigating, it was 40 acres, one guy. When we were wheel, uh, hand move, you could probably do uh, 160 acres and, and keep it up. Uh, when we went to the first pivots, yeah, maybe you could get a, or, or wheel lines, you, or uh, sorry, side wheels, or wheel lines. You could maybe do three quarters. Now we got one guy doing, you know, some 30 some quarters. And uh, it's just. Uh, Truly amazing uh, the reduction in those uh, in those costs on that side, but we traded it for capital costs. So the big thing I want to talk about is is the Sundial Irrigation Project. Um, the beer ID opened up uh, for new acres. Um, talked to a bunch of uh, dryland farmers now in, in 2012. I mean they had five six years of decent rains and and had some great crops. So it was maybe not the best time to start that discussion. 
with people who've uh, been dry landing for, for 100 years or more. So a group of us uh, worked together with the district staff to identify if a multi-farm uh, project was feasible. And I, I think a shout out to, uh, to uh, Richard Beard and his staff. The cooperation that came through that and their interest, uh, even though they didn't know if it was a, a GO project or not, um, they spent district, uh, or they, they, they allowed district support and encouragement, understanding of, of the potentials and, and whatnot. And uh, that cooperation um, really did uh, impress all, all of the farmers that were involved in that project and, uh, and also certainly myself. It, uh, it makes a difference when you've got a, a let's try it attitude rather than uh, you can't do it attitude. And, and then just a shout out to, uh, and I, I suspect the board must have some influence over that as well. So we brought in some experts, um, some of them are here, Len Ring uh, got him out there to take a look at, at what the options might be and, and how we could do it. Um, Tom, of course, uh, <coughs> spent a little, a couple shekels over there trying to, trying to put together uh, a bit of a society and, and uh, various different other options. Did some cost estimates, looked to be approximately about 3,250 uh, an acre to develop it without the land if all of those farmers would have participated. The end of the day, about 20 quarters were actually applied for and paid the non-refundable down payment. There was concerns about costs. Um, like I said, they were making money on dry land and why do you add, uh, <laughs> when you bought, bought land for $200 or $300 an acre at grandpa's time, do you wanna spend $3,000 on that same acre and, and, uh, and work a lot harder? Um, concerns about costs, uh, canal access through a non-participating parcel uh, significant issue. Uh, the neighbor didn't see any real benefit to it, couldn't find a place for benefit and, and just to resist and say, I don't want anybody there. Had I been an oil company, um, we'd have had a pipeline through there and, and uh, gone through a, another process. Water does not have those same rights. Um, and then of course, worries about governance. You know, how good is it gonna be to cooperate with people you, you may, you know, ownership can change and whatnot. So governance uh, on a private sort of uh, type of infrastructure operation like that uh, certainly was a concern for some of the producers. Uh, at the end of the day, um, I ended up buying a couple of quarters of guys that kind of wanted to go but really didn't want to spend the money. And so uh, we ended up doing the entire thing with our own operation privately. So about 2,900 acres under 21 seven tower pivots now and, and three, uh, or four three tower pivots. Uh, the intake on the main canal uh, on BRID uh, uh, right away uh, is about 700 horsepower, four, four big turbine pumps, two 24 inch pipelines that, that go out and about, uh, so we put about 12 miles of main line from 24 inch down to, uh, down to 12 inch. Um, it was sized, uh, so one of the decisions we had to make is, is how do you size it, you know, and, and because one operator was handling it, we decided to go a little lower than uh, what districts do. They're trying to be at about 90%. Most of them, uh, we were probably around the 85% and the potential, we're, we'd be comfortable running at about 80% uh, because we can move water from, from parcel to parcel. Um, and we also added a variable rate on seven parcels that have topography issues. So project was, uh, was fairly tight. You see the red line at the top. So there was about a mile of going through uh, uh, another party's uh, land base who had no, uh, no interest in irrigation on it or, or not suitable. Uh, but the rest of the project was relatively tight and that was a way that we were able to manage the costs or not. Len, do not look like that. You've seen this before. <laughs> you went over it with me. <laughs> it still looks the same. Okay, okay, just checking if we did the job right. Um, on the beer ID, uh, uh, the pump site on the main canal, about 700 horsepower uh, split into a, a header with, with uh, two systems. We can actually open it up and run the whole system as one, but uh, because of elevation differences on the two sides of the project, um, we, we do usually run it separately. Um, by uh, 2018, uh, I had staff 
cleaning and, and myself uh, cleaning algae and weeds off of the uh, the screen uh, every hour at some points right through the night in, in, in uh, July. Uh, the district, of course, has done some work on that. And last year, of course, things were a lot better, but we did put an aqua systems in, a screen cleaner, and, and that's really reduced labor. But uh, you can have all the systems in place, but if they can't get the water to the pump, there's headaches. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about costs. Um, so project total for, for our operation was about uh, just about $9 million without land. Uh, turned out about $3,000 per acre developed, and that included irrigation rights. Um, those are lower, uh, they're probably 30% lower than what they are today. Uh, suitability testing, three-phase power, uh, pipeline and trenching, payment to neighboring landowners, pivots, and some land work. So not an insignificant uh, project, uh, trying to talk the banker into, into something like that, even though the opportunity is significant, uh, it's still a challenge to uh, make sure you, you cash flow it, and uh, that was one of our challenges. So, so out of that process, and I mean, all of these have their surprises, although generally it went very, very good, um, we're pretty blessed with the capacity in this area in terms of excavators, uh, in terms of some of our dealers, uh, and then the expertise that's out there and available to us. I mean, whether they came from government or, or uh, in the area, uh, certainly makes it a smoother process in southern Alberta than it would in some areas. I, uh, I think we underestimate how we keep our costs down just because of that center of expertise that we have in the area. Um, some of my observations, multi-farm uh, projects are, are uh, private projects are difficult. Um, trust issues, uh, just getting it together, um, getting a vision together is, is, uh, is tough. Uh, district cooperation and encouragement is pretty important. Uh, when you walk into the engineer's office at the district and they go, eh, I don't think we can do that, uh, that's a whole different story when they say, well, okay, let's see what we can do. And uh, certainly as directors, I think um, that encouragement, if you want to move things forward, there has to be an attitude of service there. And uh, I, I can say very much from the BRID, for the BRID that that was an attitude that we were blessed with. Um, issues, access issues from non-participating neighbors can stop projects or become very costly. Had I tried to do a three or four pivot project, my land access costs for the neighbor would have made it unsustainable. Um, irrigation suitable st suitability studies are not based on current best available technology. Certainly Irrigation Council, I think, needs to start doing some hard thinking about the principles behind irrigation suitability. With the technology we have, some of the, some of the principles are still there based on, on flood irrigation or um, side, side wheel irrigation. Um, there is some review being done by the provincial government when these things come up. However, uh, the, uh, I think there is opportunity to say, hey, we're going to put certain restrictions on, but the newer technology efficiency, I think, allows us to irrigate land that, that not that long ago was not suitable. Um, drainage issues uh, are very difficult for private en entities. I think the... Uh, the, what we heard uh, the, yesterday from Ontario, we need to do some real serious looking on where we're going to go on that. And uh, new irrigation projects may be limited to very large operations who can handle the challenges. Unless you're right next to the canal, um, when the districts are not doing the infrastructure close to where you need to take access, uh, the burdens and the hurdles are, are very, very difficult. So if, if you're any small distance from the canal, um, and, I, and I think the districts may have to start doing some rethinking on this issue. Doesn't matter, I, don't, I wouldn't mind have paid the infrastructure costs to the district, but having them own them and run them, I think is something that needs to be considered more seriously. Um, water rates, I pay the same water rates as everybody else in the district. Um, but I'm doing most of the ditch riders' work for 30-some quarters, um, as well as the infrastructure. Um, so if you're not willing to put infrastructure money into delivering some of this, maybe you have to start thinking about 
um, variable rates for charging uh, water delivery if a lot of it's being done by the producer. Um, the other thing, districts, well, I mentioned this, districts should be considering owning delivery infrastructure to the parcel. The current system of developing irrigation is hodgepodge. It's opportunistic. Um, larger operators can make it work. Smaller operators can't if there's a bit of distance. So it's not based on best available land uh, or a longer term project. And so I think districts need to seriously start looking 50 years down the road to what the system could be looking like if we, we uh, build it all out. The kind of thinking that uh, Zobel was talking about, you know, where you have to look down, take a risk, but have a vision for where you might be able to go and deal with some of those issues. Districts do have the legal authority to develop infrastructure, and, uh, and that's quite a bonus. That's what the oil uh, pipeline uh, industry has, uh, but private uh, irrigation people do not have that. The other one, and I, I hope that's starting to come, I'm starting to hear good things out of the County of Lethbridge and, and the two districts there, need to start to consider area drainage infrastructure. Uh, the drainage district legislation is available, but when we're adding water um, to, to maintain highly productive land, uh, that drainage thing isn't gonna become a larger and larger issue. Many of you would know Drainage Outfit came in from Manitoba, spent three years here beating their head against the wall, trying to get permits, uh, trying to get projects done, taking between a year and two and a half years to get uh, permissions, and they've walked away and gone back. Uh, they just, they can't, can't do business in Southern Alberta. And uh, that's partly to do with the Water Act and partly to do with, uh, with a lack of understanding of the balance between economic and environmental when it comes to irrigation de development. And uh, I mentioned this, the principles of irrigation suitability should probably uh, be reviewed, and I think that'll have to be driven probably by irrigation council and then moved up the ladder. Um, and this one, I mean, I had to do something that pissed people off. It's time for the district to consider water meters for all, or water meters for all um, irrigation. The next level of efficiency, water use per unit of production, will only be reached if water is measured. I looked at some numbers. When my grandpa was doing um, barley, he was getting about 60 bushels where he used about 30 inches of water on that land. Um, this year on our subsurface, uh, we hit about 120 bushels on about nine inches. So if you add about four inches for moisture, I don't think we quite got that. But the efficiency of water use per unit of production uh, can, you know, has, has moved significantly already. It can continue to move more, but it's not going to be driven until we know and measure what we're doing. Um, and then the way to drive that, because the question is who's going to pay for the ma uh, monitoring, if I've got that many inches of water or, or gallons of water available, um, if I can irrigate another 15 or 20 percent of uh, my acres on that, I think you can see water use efficiency go up and that's a way of paying for that process. And then finally, ongoing irrigation development is important for Southern Alberta, but I think all of the players in this room and, and, and a few other rooms need to become more deliberate about our common goals. What I picked up from Shade and, and company from BTAP was taking a bit bigger picture look and, and using scale and opportunity uh, to drive more economic development. Um, and I think districts are going to have to be part of the lead on that. But irrigation, it's still well worth the effort. All of my whining, I, I still think it was a very worthwhile thing to have done. Um, we do have a solid legislative framework. Uh, we have well-kept up infrastructure, world-class people, technical research operations as well as producers, uh, provincial government support, although you have to keep working on it, as well as some federal. Uh, processing the marketing options, a strong environmental record, including on efficiency and water use, and I think an ongoing willingness to improve. So, thank you. Any questions? I'm fine with. John, I have one question for you. Um, on, on your drip irrigation, um, I have one question about yep. that is, first of all, did you, did you leave that tape in the ground and what crops were you able to grow under that and do you see yourself putting more of that in there? 
So on the drip irrigation, uh, because we got quite a few acres of irrigation, we decided we better find out what that technology is and how it's working. I've run marrow fat peas, um, corn, and, and beans, I think, and, and, uh, and uh, barley. So we've run, we've run a, duff, a number of different crops. Uh, it's in the ground, 44 inch um, spacing, about eight inches down. If I was doing it again, I'd probably go around 12 inches down. Uh, biggest challenge is small seeded crops and a completely dry spring. How do you get them started? You need that, that lucky rain. Um, I had originally thought that subsurface would be ideal for corners and oddball pieces. I think the cost of maintaining it and, and servicing it makes a lot more sense to be on 80 acres or 160 acres. I think you can keep your capital costs down. This, this is my opinions, okay? I, you probably want to talk to the people that are doing it. Bit of a challenge for our deep rooted or rooted root crops. Um, where that might go, you know, that, that uh, I, th I don't think we have that kind of figured out. With the right, pro my sense is we need a higher, higher value crops or higher sort of gross potential sales for it to become a big deal, or we need to start uh, monitoring or um, uh, uh, metering water. That will drive me to put a whole bunch of that in because certainly I can see the, the cost savings there. But if there's no, you know, if you've got your allocation of 18 inches um, and if you use 12 of it, you don't get any benefit out of the, the, the ones that you save, um, then there's no real drive at this point with the capital cost other than in, in certain circumstances. So I believe it's a coming thing. Um, you know, you got to keep the cost down on installation and, and things like that. Uh, but it's, it's got potential. Um, I'm not sure how I would do it with potatoes, Mike. Uh, you know, you'd almost have to bed them and, and, and leave it on top and, and take it back up, I guess. Hi, John. Thanks. I'm really interested in uh, hearing more about drip irrigation. But uh, one individual who you may wish to contact with, some of you I think already know, is a farmer from Tabor. Uh, who came to my office uh, through a mutual acquaintance to talk about drip irrigation. He's got interest in California. He's quite experienced with his name is jo uh, Franklin DeLue uh, out of Round Tabor. And uh, uh, he's a, we a wealth of information, produced a paper that I, he provided to me, and that's uh, really raised my interest in, in learning more about drip irrigation and the future of it. And I think it's uh, probably the next transitional uh, mode of uh, application. Uh, and uh, hopefully uh, we do hear more about it, and I'd certainly invite you to talk to me more about it. And any of those who uh, uh, seek to uh, perhaps put anything on my desk that I should know about as the critic for agriculture and forestry uh, and the NDA opposition, feel free to email me, email me. I'm easy to Google. It's Lauren Dack uh, at the uh, uh, Alberta Legislature. So thanks a lot. Yep. And I just mentioned um, Southern Irrigation is the one I worked with, and uh, they've They've seemed to focus some real people on, on the technology and the, and the service and support side on it. Um, I, Mike, the other thing is disease. We've really seen a reduction in diseases. I, uh, you know, you don't have those droplets splotting. So um, I'm not done with it, I can tell you that. I've got too much invested in iron right now, but who knows. Thanks, eh?